Hi, my name is Holly, and I'm a Cree and Scottish Métis woman in Alberta, Canada. In this series, I invite you to join me on my journey of reconnecting and learning about what it means to be Métis. This is Modern Métis Canada. Like most Indigenous people, the Métis people have their own traditional medicine. Métis medicine focuses on all aspects of the individual's health, mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual. Traditionally, the Métis women were the healers, and also midwives who provided the medicines to heal the family and community members. Today, both men and women are healers. Métis medicines almost always include traditional Indigenous plants and remedies. Although a few medicines have been handed down from the Métis Euro settler ancestors. Most medicines are gathered from the local environment and then they are dried and stored in the home where they are then either ground into a powder or made into healing items like tinctures, teas, poultices and salves. The medicines can be used to treat a variety of different ailments. Some medicines can be used as painkillers, anti-inflammatory agents, and digestive aids. Some are used to treat specific ailments like arthritis, asthma, diabetes, stomach issues, tuberculosis, cancer, headaches, toothaches, and many more. Traditional protocols must be adhered to when gathering plants. The gatherer must say a prayer of thanks to the creator and offer tobacco or another gift. Medicine gatherers should only harvest what is needed and no plants should be harmed in the harvesting of medicine. There are four sacred herbs and lead medicines that the Métis people use. Sweetgrass, cedar, sage, and tobacco. These herbs are used for cleansing, offerings, and for prayer. Some other medicinal plants are burdock, balsam, wild sarsaparilla, blueberries, plantain, choke cherries, and more. Some medicines can be harvested from animals, such as burbot, which is from freshwater cod, liver oil, fish milk, goose grease, bear grease, and skunk oil. To learn more about Métis medicine, I'm joined by Kaylin Kodiak, who's a herbalist, teacher, and the owner of Kodiak Herbal. Tanche Nesakasan Kaylin Kodiak. Hi, my name is Kaylin Kodiak. I'm a Métis herbalist from Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Uh, I live in Calgary. My family are the Delorums from Whitehorse Plains, Red River Valley, uh, Manitoba. And we've been in Alberta for uh, seven or eight generations. I am a Métis herbalist. Um, I studied with a, a European School of Herbalism uh, for three years to get a clinical herbalist designation. Um, I'm a registered herbalist and the current president of the Alberta Herbalist Association. Uh, as a Métis herbalist, I have the pleasure of sharing information about the traditional plants that we use for medicine, food, tools, clothing, shelter, uh, as Métis people who traveled across the prairie and had to rely on the land. Um, I got into herbalism uh, for a few reasons. Um, I've always really loved to take plants apart and look at all the little pieces. And then, you know, so as a kid, I realized there's seeds and roots and different shapes of leaves and different types of flowers. And that always really interested me, the, the botany of the plants. Um, and then also as a young person, I had a healing journey where I, where I was really sick and the doctors didn't have any answers. Um, and I think I was about 19 years old when my mom took me to a naturopath and that uh, he fixed me up really quick within about three months. So um, after years of not being able to get help, I found help through plants. And um, that made me really curious about what else can plants do. Um, and so uh, I didn't pursue that for a few years until I, I came across a brochure for the Wild Rose College of Natural Healing, which is a, one of Canada's largest herb colleges. And it was based here in Calgary. And they ran herbal medicine classes. And so I always, I thought that was really interesting. And after maybe the 10th time that I passed the brochure, I said, hey, maybe I can do that. And so I looked into it some more and um, I got the funding to go to the college. And from the first field day where we go out into the woods with a herbalist to identify plants, I was hooked. Um, I had a special feeling 
and I just knew that this was something that I wanted to do and that I could be really passionate about and just um, I wanted to know everything about all the plants um, and so uh, since then I've taken all the training that I can get my hands on and um, researched all the herbs that I uh, especially focusing in Canada but all the herbs that I really could uh, there's different systems of herbalism from all over the world Tibetan herbalism Ayurveda Chinese medicine um, and so uh, there's just an endless amount of things to learn about the plants and and that makes me like really happy and really passionate to have a hobby I can do forever uh, I do have some favorite herbs uh, rhodiola rosea or all of the rhodiola family um, are so special these are tiny little plants they're succulents and they grow really high up in the mountains um, in the Himalayas in the Rocky Mountains and a few other regions where um, the air is thin so they are able to take oxygen um, from very thin air and survive and um, they uh, they're able to um, in, like thicken your blood and give your blood more energy and more um, like more give you more stamina so they're really good for people climbing high and living high up in the mountains they literally enable your body to absorb more oxygen use more oxygen um, and so they give you energy and they give you stamina they uh, increase your immune system um, they're little antidepressant powerhouses for people who live in cold um, airy climates there's a ton of research on rhodiola too uh, which is really neat I really love it when the research uh, from modern science aligns with the traditional knowledge from various cultures, so cultures as far away as Tibet and India and Canada, we all use them the same. Um, and that's really neat. You know, there's a, an ancient science that herbalists used to find out how a plant works and what it does for you. And it's now um, corroborated by modern science. An another one of my favorite herbs is the common dandelion, which of course is everybody's best friend in the garden. Uh, and in your lawn probably um, and instead of spraying them we could just use them traditionally by eating them and making medicine out of them uh, and before you know it you wouldn't have to spray anymore so I'm usually asking people to eat their weeds uh, in classes uh, rather than spray them so if you have daddy lines in your yard and you want to try them out the whole thing is edible uh, basically you dig up the root and it's kind of like a carrot or a turnip so you just chop it up and fry it and put butter and salt on there uh, the leaves are great in salads, especially in the springtime, uh, so any time before June. Um, and then after June, the leaves are a, a really good tea. So you just dry them and use them, boil them in water and make tea. And this is all really, really nutrient-dense food, and it's a traditional food. Um, dandelions come from Europe, so you might say, like, why is that a traditional indigenous food? But it is because the Métis were a mixed culture. And um, we knew the dandelions were, were food and medicine when our ancestors brought them over, and we just continued to use them. So it became um, part of our medicine. Um, the traditional name for dandelions is pisali, which is uh, it's from the French, and it means to pee the bed. And I think that's a really funny name for them. Um, they, uh, they help you to... Um, to pee, like if you're having a urinary tract infection or something. So the the story was that if you ate too many dandelions, you would pee the bed. So they called them pizali. I love to talk about Métis herbalism. So we make the syrup first and then we boil the buds in them. And that allows the sugar actually like will absorb the oil for us. Um, and that's how we make our syrup. And so a simple syrup is a cup of sugar to a cup of water. Um, I'm really lucky because my great great grandma wrote down her experiences and uh, passed on teachings from her mother about how we used plants for medicine. Uh, once you get your bottle of syrup, try a, a little drop or two on your tongue and tell me how you like it. Part of learning about medicine is tasting it. and uh, We learn so much from taste. Um, I don't have time to talk about it now, but we talk about it a lot in Le Bon Michin. Um, it tells your body what to expect, essentially, when you're eating, right? So. It kind of prepares the way for the medicine. Um, so I'm out of material, but I thank you all for listening to me today to talk about my passion. Um, it's always such a pleasure to make medicine with people. I'm really glad that you all came. So Lawrence Barkwell and Anne Anderson are well-respected Métis herbalists who wrote a lot about our culture. And, and those teachings are rare. Um, so Anne Anderson wrote in the 70s and 80s, I believe. Uh, my grandma was writing in um, 
the 1920s and 30s and 40s. And, um, and before that, she kept a diary. And um, all that information, it's just there for me. And a lot of it was lost because we always shared oral teachings. So um, I'm really, yeah, really, really lucky to have that. And, and so glad that, that I had an ancestor who uh, was a herbalist. Um, that being said, most grandmas were herbalists in the 1800s. They knew all the plants that we eat because they were the ones picking them. So I would say most women were herbalists at the time. Um, and probably a lot of the men too knew how to, um, you know, disinfect a wound or something on the fly, you know, while we were traveling. Um, but there were also medicine people among the First Nations. I haven't heard of a Métis medicine person specifically who was trained in those traditional ways. Um, but we are very closely re closely related to the Anishinaabe and the Cree, um, and they for sure had medicine people who we might go see if we needed additional healing. Also, the oldest person in the family often would say the prayers at any gathering and they might lead prayers for someone who is healing because a big part of healing is gathering together as a community um, and praying for the person who's sick. Uh, Dr. Ann Anderson wrote about um, family healing amongst the Métis and I really loved the way that she described it. She said that when someone was very sick and they hadn't responded to the first few attempts at medicine, um, the whole family, the whole community would gather at that person's home. And the family of the person would serve um, something to eat, like a bannock or something, and some tea. And as they were drinking and eating, they would say, Nina Naskman, and it means I am grateful. And that meant that they were so grateful for the healing that was going to be done for their family member. Um, and so while they were in the, the living room or somewhere offering their support and sitting together, the sick person would be you know, maybe in the, the bedroom or maybe in the same room, and they would know that their whole community was rooting for them and was there for them, praying for them. And we know that prayer has um, power to heal. People who get prayed for get better. Um, there would be a medicine person or grandma or someone would be in the kitchen making up the, the plants and also praying over them while she cooked and saying, Naskaman, and then um, they would give the sick person the med medicine and any other doctoring that they might need. And... Um, this was a sort of community healing, and I just imagine if we had something like that that we could do today, uh, especially with a lot of our youth having depression and other mental illnesses, can you imagine all of your teachers, the kids at your school, all of your friends, all your aunties and uncles and cousins and grandmas, and all just coming together, how, like, how loved you would feel and how supported you would feel, and to know that these, all, these people all made time to come together and pray for you and you know cared about you, I think. Um, that sense of community would be extremely healing. In Métis culture, we have a teaching about respect, and we have a value of respect and reciprocity, and that means that we're always giving back when we receive a gift. Uh, so we use um, tobacco a lot of the time, and that's a gift from our indigenous ancestors to us in order to give something back. Um, tobacco is given when you don't have something of equal value. And because everything we have, uh, all of our clothes, all of our food, and everything comes from the earth, there's nothing we could give back truly. Um, so we use tobacco in that place. And that keeps the relationship balanced so that we're not just taking and taking. I have an elder that says um, that we are the younger brothers and sisters of all of the plants and the animals and the mountains and waters. And they are uh, tasked with teaching us and bringing us upright so that we learn to be good people. And um, she says, when we're, when we're born, babies, they're grabby, right? You show them something shiny and they grab it. And, they, um, and so humans are very much like babies throughout our lives. Um, and we need to learn all the lessons that we're being taught. And one of them is not to just take, 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 but to give back and take care of our environment. Uh, and then it will always be there for us. We'll always be able to live here if we keep keep it clean, keep it healthy. There'll always be food for us if we plant more food and we take care of the, the plants that are already here. There'll always be clean water if we take care of the water. Um, so that's a, it's a balanced relationship. We're not just taking from our Mother Earth, we're being good children. It's my honor to uh, get to talk about the bear today. Um, and that means a lot to me. The bear is a, a really important animal to me and it has always been a really important animal and guide and friend to humans as well, especially the Métis and other Indigenous people. Uh, we do have a bear hide out in the car, keeping cool. 
um, but it's not quite at the stage where we'll get to smoke it today. So uh, we will salt it. That's about all we can do to it, unfortunately, today. Bears and humans share a lot of medicine. Our bodies, although we're different in a myriad of ways, there are many ways in which medicines do act the same in our bodies. So we learned a lot of our medicine from bears. I have a few elders that I've learned bear, um, bear teachings from. Uh, the first elder uh, was my great, great grandma. To me, the bear is such a healing spirit. And I think he's our absolutely our biggest healer. He teaches us to heal ourselves. Also, you can ask the bear spirit to help you heal uh, and to help you, uh, especially times when you require courage. So uh, bears require a lot of respect, live bears, right? And the bear spirit requires a lot of respect as well. Um, so the bear spirit, you can um, honor him at any time with tobacco um, or a gift of salmon and berries. Those are things bears really love to eat. Um, and what you would do is make a prayer over that gift and put it in the fire and the bear spirit will receive it. So anytime you wanna say thank you or ask for help, um, it's always important to give something back and those are things bears really love. Some of the challenges and issues that face Métis people now really affect our health mentally, physically, and emotionally. And I believe that through culture we can help to overcome some of these. So part of plant medicine is helping us to deal with some of the physical effects of um, the emotional trauma that previous generations and this generation have faced. Uh, as a white appearing person, um, I can't speak to the experience of racism, but absolutely it exists, and I have witnessed it happening to other people in the Métis community. Um, and uh, the more we share about who we really are, I think the more understanding we can cultivate so that we can help to reduce racism. Um, I'm, I have so much hope for Gen Z. <laughs> As a generation of really positive uh, it, people who are accepting. Like, um, so I'm really hoping Gen Z will just do away with the racism issue entirely. Um, but we, you know, we have to bring them up that way. Um, and so uh, I get to go into schools and that means a lot to me. I always try to share like the fun and exciting um, and really relatable aspects of Métis culture so the kids can, can understand who we are and also not be um, afraid of us as outsiders, you know. Uh, other problems that we face absolutely are health related um, problems such as high blood pressure. Um, we have obesity, diabetes, um, kind of everything that comes with that. And there's, there's reasons for that. There's trauma-based reasons um, for people having uh, a particular dietary choices. There's also um, um, like reasons within our, our bodies, like biological reasons that are inherited from our parents. Um, and then there's also our way of life, which has changed drastically. So we used to consume between six and 8,000 calories a day, especially the men, but the women as well, because we both did very heavy labor. And then we would do, like, we would be scraping hides, which if you, you know, you build forearms fast when you're scraping hides, um, you know, working with things, um, like your hands would be strong, you'd be sewing, you'd be pulling leather. Um, and that's just the women's work, right? Um, like it's all labor intensive, hauling water, you know, carrying your kids around, like, yeah, we were fit. We were fit people. And um, the men would be, uh, you know, like lifting bales that were over 200 pounds and stuff. So it's um, culturally we, we've changed in how we eat and how we how we exercise. And we just we mostly took the calorie burning out, but the calorie consumption is still kind of like up. Um, yeah, there's an imbalance, I guess, in the way that we eat and exercise now they don't match anymore also we have access to all these processed foods now um, and if you don't have a lot of money it can be hard to eat properly so um, a lot of metis are still hunters and those traditional foods are the healthiest thing for us our traditional diet is very low sugar uh, the only sugar sources on the prairies are um, pretty much some, a couple of roots and you know a dozen species of berries. Um, and then of course maple syrup, if you were lucky enough to be out east and to get maple syrup. Um, but they weren't, it wasn't a year round thing when we were eating all this sugar. Traditionally, we were eating a lot of saturated fat, animal fat, a lot of it. It was in the marrow, uh, we would just slather it on our bread, um, but we were able to burn calories and burn, that we use the fat as fuel. Um, rather than it's sort of sitting in our arteries. And I think that's a big part of where that 
Um, we have the cholesterol problems and things that we have comes from, um, we couldn't get away with that amount of saturated fat today. So bears and we, like a lot of the same berries, uh, humans and bears, um, and because uh, we all like, we like all the sweet berries, both of us, we both have sweet tooths. Um, so if the bears were already munching at a spot, we wouldn't go to that spot, we'd leave them be. Um, and if we're picking at a spot, bears might come in, and if they're pretty insistent about it, we'd clear out of that spot, because that's, you know, there. So there's really no reason to have to kill a bear, um, except that, uh, like, except for, for meat. And we did eat bear. Um, bear was a, considered like a, um, a feast food. Um, so bear steaks were uh, like a feast food. Bear could be very fatty. Um, so you could fry them up kind of bacon-like. Uh, bears uh, is really rich and really uh, nourishing. And it was, the meat itself is a medicine, one of the, the medicines we get from the body of the bear. But it's really wet, so like I'll salt it and then all the water is gonna come out and cool and then I'll salt it again, yeah. <laughs> so the meat is so red and rich. Um, it was used to build people up, they were sick, or build up. Um, elderly and stuff, keep people strong. Um, it was even rumored to increase virility, so if a couple got married and after a year they hadn't become pregnant, um, the man might go out hunting for more bear to eat. And another thing that uh, it's so red, it contains a lot of iron, so it's also used for people with anemia um, to eat a, a bear-rich diet. So we're just boiling some water right now to make a tea that's um, safe for everybody to try a little taste of. Um, and it's a bear medicine. So bear medicine specifically, um, they often are roots um, and they are brown and hairy like a bear. Uh, they're often really rich and oily, like greasy root, they have plant oils in them um, and they often are very pungent smelling so they can smell really good like ginger. Ginger is a, is a bear root, so it's sarsaparilla, which is root beer, right, root beer scent. And then this one we're gonna try here, it's called uh, Devil's Club. And um, that one also has a real smell, but it's refreshing. It's a refreshing smell. But so this is Devil's Club and Burdock, and there's um, the, what you're really tasting mostly is the Devil's Club, um, and it's such a special medicine to the people of BC. Uh, most of the First Nations there consider it a very, very sacred medicine. They don't share their teachings outside of their community. Uh, Métis also use this herb. We didn't have the same rules, but what we can use it for is diabetes. Isn't that strange? Wow. It's sweet tasting, but it balances your blood sugar very, very well. Herbal medicine and using plants, needing plants, getting to know plants, spending time around plants makes me feel so close to my culture. Um, it was definitely, for me, the entry point into getting deeper into my culture in a big way uh, because we learn so much and receive so much um, comfort and solidarity and support from plants. Um, I mean, just on a physical level, without plants, we would die. You know, you need them for the vitamins. Um, but without plants also, um, we wouldn't have oxygen. We wouldn't have um, the same water systems that we do now. You know, the water would run differently. And um, those are all just physical things the plants give us, but to me, they give a real, um, like they give me friendship. Um, it's so reassuring to see plants that you know when you go out and around and to, and they almost like wave at you when you go by. We use them spiritually and they give you emotional comfort and emotional healing. And um, for me, they've always just been refreshing to be around plants. Children should grow up around plants and learning about them because they'll just learn to be good people. The herbalists and medicine women of the past were the caregivers of the community and had a significant role in the well-being of the group. Men and women of today continue to learn and share these teachings to spread knowledge and awareness of the plants around us. In our next episode of Modern Métis Canada, I'll be talking about traditional crafts such as beading and weaving. <laughs>